Well, welcome back once again to Talking With Tech. My name is Lucas Stuber, joined today by Rachel Madel. How are you? I'm so good. How are you guys doing? I'm fantastic. And Chris Begay, how are you? I'm here too. I'm great. Can't wait to talk about what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, this is an exciting one. So we always really enjoy doing these uh, roundtable discussions. And today we want to talk about early intervention. Um, and we just happen to have somebody on the line here who is a specialist in early intervention, right, Rachel? <laughs> yes, I do a lot of work with emergent communicators of so kids who, you know, are just starting to use single words or they're not using words. Um, and it always lends itself to the question, when do you start using AAC and right. how young is too young? And I get that question all the time. And it's a really interesting one. There was actually an article in the ASHA Leader a few months ago, and it was talking about using AAC for kids as early as 12 months, which, you know, some speech therapists listening might be like, whoa, that's so young. It's really cool that they're starting to do research and seeing how effective AAC can be. I have an anecdote to share of a family that I worked with, and the little boy was not talking, and he was about 14 months old. After a few weeks of trying to get him to imitate, you know, even just basic actions wasn't working. He was not approximating. He was having a really hard time imitating signs. It left me thinking, okay, now what? It felt like, whoa, this is so young to start using AAC, but at the same time, I can't in good faith keep trying to get a kid to imitate approximations and signs if it's just not working. And so I introduced pictures with them and it was really effective. It really changed his ability to communicate his basic wants and needs, tantrums lesson, because he was able to communicate at a very basic level. But it kind of lends itself to the question, when do you start using AAC? Hey, real, real quick, Rachel, let me ask you, when you say early intervention, do you mean birth to two or birth to three? Because I think, at least in the States, that's different in different states. But what is it yeah. where you are? Well, you know, what's interesting is that, so I don't work with a ton of kids that are birth to three, but I work with a lot of kids who aren't talking. Um, and sometimes they come to me at four or five. Um, so, you know, technically it's not an early intervention per se, but, you know, when you're considering the kinds of skills that we're working on, you know, it's the same as I would be working on with sometimes a two-year-old. I hear exactly what you're saying, language development wise, like how there's tons of kids that are uh, at, at that age range. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes they're four or five years old, which is really unfortunate because it feels like so much time has been lost and so many supports could have been put in place so that we could have a very different child um, at four or five. And I think that just lends itself to supporting early intervention and AAC at a younger age, um, which I think is, it's it's hard. There's actually a quote um, that I love, and it talks about AAC not being a last resort, um, not looking at AAC as a last resort intervention, um, but instead really viewing it as a way to support language development. And um, I always kind of explain this to the parents that I work with and the teachers, you know, just because we use AAC doesn't mean we're giving up on verbal communication. Um, we're not giving up on the signs that these kids already are using. Um, it's really just a tool. It's a tool to kind of help facilitate language, help support expressive language and receptive language a lot of times. And there's no reason in my eyes to, you know, stunt expressive language development because a child's not able to communicate verbally. Um, and I think that's what happens. We kind of push so hard for verbal and and then we get to a point where, wow, they're three and they're still not talking. I guess we should, you know, explore other options when, you know, my thought process is, you know, don't wait that long. Um, don't wait until they're three or sometimes four years old to go to AAC options, whether that be low tech or high tech. You know, we can start doing things so much sooner. AAC never hurts, right? So I think that's what the research shows, right? It never hurts. So Another way to phrase that question would be, is it ever too early to start AAC? If not, do it for as early as possible. One question I wonder, when you, when you talk about this, you know, 12-month intervention student, how do we define AAC? Are we talking about signing here? I mean, are we talking about any other modality? Well, you know, that's really interesting is because I know that the definitions are kind of unclear, right? Some people are like, oh, approximations can be considered AAC, um, which I don't agree with that. Sign language can be a very no-tech AAC, if you will. 
personally, in my own experience, um, and we can kind of get into pecs and picture exchange and how we utilize those or don't utilize those and our thoughts on that. Um, but I think a really easy way is to just start incorporating more visual support. I think that that a lot of times can be so beneficial to kids as a quick and easy way to really understand how to get their needs met without having the requirement of an approximation that maybe a lot of people aren't understanding or a sign. A lot of times I work with kids and their signs are approximations of signs. You know, sign language isn't universal. Not everybody understands sign language, but then on top of it, you have kids who are approximating signs, which is even harder. It's like, oh, that's his version of eat. I'm like, okay, well, I'm happy you told me that, but I would have never known. So I think that using sign language and using just basic pictures is a really good place to start. Well, and that's, I mean, you, you hit on something that we, we deal with, with with older age too, right? Using signs in, this, in the supermarket when you're lost isn't as universally comprehensible as necessarily having an AAC device that's going to, you know, provide comprehensible English output, you know, to, the, to that listener that may not have ever learned sign language. You know, I guess one of the questions I always have is like, say we're working on, with a student that's just turned two, you know, has the classic uh, regression sort of profile that we would expect in ASD, um, maybe had uh, a few basic words that, um, you know, now are sort of not being used as much and some approximated signs. So what do we do? Do we do we reinforce those signs and their ability to communicate with their family, especially that this is, you know, an early intervention standpoint where they probably are interacting primarily with their family and try to use that to cascade symbolic knowledge, you know, for the next uh, little period of time? Or do we get started with symbolic, uh, you know, with, with picture exchange or with some sort of basic AAC? And it's, uh, it's obvious that we need to get started doing something, but what? One thing that I like to look at when I'm considering a child who's signing is how consistent are they using those signs and are they actually intentional signs? Because what I see a lot is, you know, a child will do the sign for more and if they don't get the desired outcome, they'll then sign eat and they'll go, kind of go rapid fire, go through all the signs that they know, which is a potential indicator that they don't understand. So they don't actually have that symbolic knowledge that, you know, this more, the sign for more is different than the sign for eat, which is different than all done. Um, so that's a big indicator to me. If a child is using signs very consistently and accurately, then I'm, I'm, I'm happy to kind of keep supporting that. But I think that it's really important to really piece out is it intentional and do they actually understand or they're just kind of, they've memorized these, these actions that they do that will eventually get them what they want. Um, because a lot of the kids I work with, especially with autism, they don't understand the differences between these signs. So I don't think it's necessarily doing them justice to keep having them sign when they don't truly understand the difference. And that's where the visual support can come in. You can, you can sign more, show them that sign, and then show them the icon for, for more and keep building out that visual support with photos or on a device. And I think you can compare them really nicely together. Perfect. I agree. Yeah. Uh, I think it's kind of interesting because um, somehow that child that you described did learn the signs in some way, right? Uh, even if they don't have that symbolic representation for what each one means. And so that makes me question, I'll, I'll ask it right from the very beginning, uh, where are we going with that? Where are we heading with sign? Are we, can, are we going to have even more signs? Is that going to be the student's primary form of expression? Or should we be moving to something else uh, as quickly as possible? And so at some point, you have to make that decision. Um, and so if the question is, um, the question is, how early is too early? And the answer is, it's never too early. Then maybe you should be looking at it at a device as early as, yeah, two years. Why, why not? Why, what would be the possible reason not to do that? Yeah, that's a good point. I'm trying to think of a potential reason not to do it. And we're also, you know, I think biased. We are on a podcast talking about AAC all the time and how much we love it. So, um, you know, I think that the biggest roadblock potentially is that parents sometimes have a really hard time with adopting this idea that their child will be talking through a device. Especially in the beginning stages, it's hard. We introduce a device, parents kind of give up hope that spoken communication is going to come. Whereas I think when we introduce signs, it's kind of like, we can use these signs while the words are coming. We kind of transition from verbal approximations aren't working. You know, we transition to signs. It's like, you know, we're just gonna give them some signs so that we can have their needs be met while 
all the words come. Then you introduce a device and parents are like, whoa, I still want them to talk, which just goes back to this myth that we, we know is not true, that we introduce a device and the child will stop talking or it will prevent spoken communication, which we know research disproves. Is it sort of like an anti-vaxxing sort of a co concept? Like the research supports vaccination. So the research supports that your child is, if your child, if it's in your cards for your child to talk, this is going to help them talk faster as opposed to uh, let's wait and see. And because your fear is getting in the way uh, of actually supporting the student's language, let's focus on the research. Am I, is that a bad analogy? Like, yeah, no, I, to I totally think you're, you're right. I think that it's the fear. To be fair, I think that parents have a lot of decisions to make when it comes to a child with special needs. And they always have that fear that they're doing something wrong and they're not supporting their child the best way that they can. And, you know, we kind of, as clinicians, we, we try to you know, show them all the options. But a lot of times I feel like parents are just like overwhelmed with decisions to make. They don't know what the right step is. But I do think that it's fear. It is a fear-based um, decision when you're not supporting it. Something that could potentially make a world of difference. You know, I have definitely had parents or even uh, paraprofessionals. She's like, yeah, I don't think she needs that device. This is a middle school student uh, because she can talk. I'm like, yeah, but she's not talking and she's not using it. And so I had to go through the research and kind of explain the same analogy. Like this, if she's going to be more verbal, this helps her become more verbal. And so I find that I don't run into it as often as, as other people I, I seem to find. I just wonder what the percentage is out there. Most of the parents, when I do explain it to them, like, yeah, your kid's not talking right now. And if they're going to, this is going to help them. They're like, okay, let's, let's do whatever it takes, you know? Uh, I wonder if that's becoming smaller over the years, the percentage of people that have that fear. You know? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, and I think that just technology is everywhere now. People are a lot more comfortable with technology, I think, than they used to be because it, we all have cell phones and tablets and all these things. And um, so I do think that's helping. That's helping the high-tech AAC cause. But yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. I'm wondering if um, if if there's other experiences with parent pushback that you guys have besides just they won't talk? Are there any other things that you come into contact with? Well, much more frequently is the uh, implementing it successfully. You know, I know you told me to model all the time, and I think we've covered that in previous podcasts, but not an out outright rejection. I don't want to use this because I'm afraid they're going to uh, talk. There's so much more connectivity out there where you can connect with other parents who have had similar experiences and be like, yeah, listen to them. We, we, we had that same thought, you know, we, we listened to the, per the speech therapist when they were saying we should get a device and you know, we got back in the car afterwards and we're like, honey, do you think that, the, that we should do this? Yeah, they're, they're saying we should do it. And then uh, two years later, we were turning the device back in because you know what? Kid's completely verbal now, you know, thank you very much. He's saying his INGs and he's adding ED and he's adding plural S and he's got uh, hundreds of words that he's using, combining them all over the place. And we, we're turning that sucker back in. We don't need it anymore. But thank you for giving it to us because we don't know if we'd be here if we didn't have it in the first place. You know, so connecting stories, I think, of other parents helps. Absolutely. And I always tell that story to parents that have that exact fear. And I have a client that I work with right now. And he started and he was using a Dynavox and he's literally talking so much that we were working on now social language. And I'm like, we can't be talking right now. <laughs> so it's just like, it's so crazy though, because he's so verbal and he's so communicative and it's crazy. It would be hard for a lot of people to know that he used a device to communicate when he was, you know, three and four years old. Um, so I just think you're right. We have to tell those stories and I definitely tell them to parents who are kind of struggling with this idea um, but I think that that story needs to be told more often. We, we, we all have those stories as clinicians, but it's kind of like, oh, you know, they've graduated. They don't need their device. Um, but I think that it would help a lot of parents to see, look what this device, how this device, you know, launched this child's communication skills and um, how helpful it was. It didn't, it, it didn't detract from verbal. It, it aided it and helped it. One argument that it was made to me recently, which I thought was interesting, was the idea that t taking a two-year-old and giving them a device almost violates the, the concept of presumption of competence, right? Because we need to sort of like assume at that age that the child is still going to develop uh, language. 
the obvious, I think, response to that is we have a lot of evidence that multimodal communication, um, you know, is, is great all around, whether that's just bilingualism or it's, you know, using AAC and signs and, and you know, oral language simultaneously. I think one thing that we need to, to really hit home, though, is that we do want to honor all modalities, right? So if you want oral language to continue developing, then when there is input orally, that you honor it, right? That you respect that as, um, you know, as language just as much as the use of the device would be. Um, you know, one of the other complaints that I get is, is concerns about screen time, right? Yeah, no, I get that a lot, actually. I think because I'm in LA and everybody's all about screen time. But yeah, it's like, especially with those young kids. I mean, I go into households and they have a zero tolerance policy with screens. So kids aren't able to watch any shows, play any games at a very young age. That's definitely a concern of a lot of parents is we know screen time is not good for our kids. So why would we put a screen in front of them? I'm hoping to have a good friend of mine, Stacey Landenberg, I'm hoping to have her on the podcast because she knows everything about screen time and how it can affect speech and language development. It's really interesting because I feel very conflicted because I see, you know, how sometimes too much screen time absolutely can be detrimental to speech and language development, but I also specialize in technology. So, and I know how powerful these devices can be for children who don't have the ability to use spoken communication or aren't able to utilize sign language, I think that it's kind of a tough decision that we have to make. But if approximations aren't working, we have to do something else. And I think that's where low-tech AAC can come in as a stepping stone. Once we see how effective a communication board can be or a picture exchange system, then it's like, okay, well, I can't possibly print, cut, and laminate all of these pictures that your child could potentially want to say. So that's where technology comes in. We can easily add a button on a device. Um, and I think that's the sell that I typically do to parents um, and where low-tech AAC is kind of invaluable for those parents that are like, no, no, no. Um, it's a really good stepping stone. So, so if you had to use that as a stepping stone, I would totally agree. Otherwise, I would go right to the device because how else do you model the ING? How else do you model the, the, the plural S? How else do you model ED? You, you typically, those things are not on your uh, communication board. So I can see it like strategically like, okay, these parents, I've, I've pitched the device to them and they are not going for it. Okay, then I'll take a step back. But otherwise, I'd be trying to model on those uh, on that system because how do you put the little grains of sand in the sand timer for those uh, those morph morphology morphological structures? Also, back on screen time for a second. I, I think we say screen time, but I really think there's two forms of screen time. There's active screen time and passive screen time. And what I mean by that is, you know, my daughter will sit and just watch Netflix, and you're just sitting and chilling and watching, you know, the, some Little Mermaid or something. That is passive, which is, I think, is a totally different concern that when she's playing Minecraft and her, she's actively engaging her brain to build things and solve problems, and maybe she's playing with somebody else, and when she's playing with somebody else, she's um, communicating with them. And so I, I think it's a real uh, problem that anytime we have a conversation about screen time, we just call it screen time, when really there are two forms of it, and, and, and they should be maybe studied separately, you know? putting a communication device is not just saying screen time, it's this is active screen time. And you're communicating, you're doing it with somebody else, you know? Mm -hmm. So the social, it's a social part as, as well. I have um, one kind of question to pose to you guys um, because I often get questions about PECs and do you use PECs and what about PECs and do you go straight to a device? And one reason that I like PECs it, there's a few reasons that I'm not a, the biggest fan of PECs, but one reason that I really like it is that it teaches initiation and it teaches that communication is, um, you know, reciprocal. And I think that, you know, we can, we can start a child on a device, but, you know, they can be in a room by themselves hitting, you know, iPad, iPad, iPad all day long, not understanding that somebody has to receive that message. Um, and so I do think one of the benefits of PECS is it teaches that initiation piece. You know, you have to take a picture and you have to give it to somebody. Um, now, I think we get stuck, right? I don't want, ki I don't want kids to get stuck in PECS because I don't think it's a robust system. Um, like you said, Chris, the ING endings and all those morphological endings, um, that's so important to start teaching at a really young age and start modeling. But I do think that initiation piece is, is useful. So is there anything that you guys do to support that with, you know, going straight to a device? 
Well, I think if you have a device, it's still reciprocal, right? I mean, so uh, saying want and handing over a piece of paper that has want on it or pressing want on a, on a communication device and it's a voice saying want is, uh, it's, it's the same sort of situation. If a student is sitting in a room pressing want, 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 and nothing happens, that is also a learning experience. Jeez, I'm pressing want and no one's here. Uh, I'm not getting what I want. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, you're, you're right. You're not. Uh, it'd be just like that person ripping off the, the card for want and throwing it across the room, you know? Right. So, well, how I mean, often do you hear typically developing children, you know, making noises and saying random things in other rooms? Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. How do you allow those things? Absolutely. What about um, one of the other barriers that I hear about often, which is just cost of, of low tech relative to high tech AAC? Maybe that doesn't come up as much in LA. <laughs> Very true. Um, no, but it's a very, you know, good consideration. And I think that it's, it's, it's something that we can start right away. I think sometimes the AAC, the high tech AAC process can sometimes be long and arduous, which we've talked about on other podcasts um, about how, you know, it doesn't necessarily need to be, but we're kind of really heavy a lot of times on the assessment piece and figuring out what system and what device and all these things. So what I like about low tech is that I can bring it back the next session and I can start using it, you know, and it's cheap. You don't have to worry about recommending, you know, an, an iPad and then you have to buy a $300 app because the worst thing in the world is to, to recommend a high tech system, have a family pay for it and then it's abandoned. You know, I never want to see that. So I think it's kind of a nice stepping stone. I feel like I keep saying that. I keep circling back to the stepping stone with the low tech. Um, but it can be really, uh, really useful, I think, to, to warming up to the idea of high-tech AAC. Well, and I would just chime in, too, and say that it, it is, it's becoming less expensive, too. I mean, even with a, you know, a kid's Kindle or an Android tablet, I mean, we can, it can get a, a quote-unquote high-tech device in the $30 or $40 range now. Um, just, and I'm not saying that that's going to be a robust system to last forever, but it's something that uh, you, know, you can trial. You know, even go back, what, seven years, uh, augmentative communication was outrageously expensive for anybody, right? And so to think, geez, you can get a robust language system for under $800, maybe now it comes from a place of privilege, but I think there are so many different avenues for how to get uh, $800, you know? I can go to volunteers, I can do fundraisers, I can uh, go find school districts that are um, getting rid of their old iPads and getting new iPads, you know? There are so many resources available like finding an ipad it's, it's very possible i don't want to use the excuse of i can't afford it to, to say that you can't you're sorry sorry your child doesn't get uh the ro robust language they don't get to put the, the the little grains of sand in their in their sand timer because i'm uh, sorry we just can't afford it we can't figure it out i often fear rachel that people will lean on that light tech because of that instead of taking the time to try and brainstorm how are we going to get high tech AAC. I also feel because people are more comfortable with it and they're not using it as a stepping stone. Yes, I couldn't agree more. And I think that's where I have a huge problem with the low tech because you're right, people stay within their comfort zone. And they're like, I know PECs, I've been doing PECs for 20 years, I got this. Um, you know, and it really is limiting a child's abilities and it's, it's not helping, you know, in every way possible, which is SLPs. Um, that's what we should be doing is giving every child the opportunity to expand to their, you know, their potential. And I think that a lot of uh, practitioners and ABA therapists and teachers, they feel comfortable with PECs and that's what they do. Um, I just had a kid, you know, I've been seeing him for about six months. Uh, we started a system with him and he's not using it as consistently as school would like. And so they wanna go back to PECs. And I was like, what? <laughs> no, absolutely not. It just like, there's never a situation that I can think of where I would ever wanna go back to PECs. You know, it's just like, and it's just one of those things where you keep going back to that it, this is sometimes a long game. It's so ingrained in people to, well, we'll just change the tool, right? If they can't read this book, we'll read a different book. And if we can't read that book, we'll read a different book. No, you have to teach them differently to read. Same thing with the, you have to change your intervention strategy, not change the tool. 
Absolutely. I feel like I'm going to get a lot of hate email this time. <laughs> <laughs> this is a contentious one. <laughs> and the reason I have such kind of strong feelings about this is not because it's just my opinion. And that's where it's because I've read the research and the research seems to suggest that the earlier we start with these sorts of interventions, the, the better off students will do. So what's that one from Romsky? Early intervention in AAC, what a difference 30 years makes, right? And then there was um, that ASHA leader article, AAC with energy from Beth Davidoff. And so they point to this idea that we need to start as early as possible. And I almost wish that the research would take it to the next level and say, because uh, when you say AAC, that does include the low tech, it does include hex as, as a system. So could we look at uh, the difference between uh, low tech and high tech early? I wonder if that would be an, another research article or research, uh, any PhD students out there that wanna do that? It'd probably be great, I'd love to read it. You know? Yeah. And then another thing that I really liked from those articles that you mentioned, Chris, they talked about the effects of peer modeling and how absolutely amazing it can be. Um, and it's just really interesting. I've done a lot of work in the classrooms and kids are very interested. Kids who don't have devices are very interested in the kid that does have the device. And they're constantly, you know, trying to touch it. And, you know, a lot of times teachers are like, no, you know, don't touch his device. That's his. That's his words. Um, you know, and my take on it is that it doesn't have to be, you know, all these rules surrounding the device necessarily. Um, and what I've done with some kids is shown the peers how to model on the device. Um, and a lot of times that's way more effective. As we know, peers are way more influential than adults could ever hope to be. And so if we can start incorporating those peers and saying, you know, well, let's say go and show them how to model the same way I would. Um, first of all, it's less work on the paraprofessionals and the teachers, um, but it's also more effective because then we have that peer engagement. And I, I think that's such a, such a great thing. Yeah, absolutely. I think we even had some episodes about that, right? The whole Eric Enger episode about where uh, you just provide a system for students and now that all the students are, are having it and then everyone else in the environment begins to use it even more, including the, the paraprofessionals. So you got the peers, the paraprofessionals, the teachers, everyone using it. And you know, I think we've even shared stories where uh, let's take a kindergarten classroom where the teacher just uses the system to teach the reading you know, because there's the, the, the big overlap between the sight words and uh, early reading words with uh, core vocabulary. And so, yeah, let's get the peers using it and more people using it. Everyone should be using it. Yes, that's the, the takeaway. Everybody should be using AAC. <laughs> as, as early as possible. So it sounds like we have a couple of different takeaways here, right? So one of the things to touch on is um, probably the biggest thing is that AAC intervention does not inhibit the development of speech, right? That it can facilitate all these other things through multimodal uh, communication. And um, so for that reason, there's really no reason not to get started, right? I mean, if it is a two-year-old, like, yeah, there might be considerations about low tech versus high tech or what that might look like, but there's no harm in facilitating augmented communication as early as possible. Um, you know, a second piece is, uh, you know, this, this concept of, of other people learning the AAC strategies, right? So whether that's peer modeling, whether that's training parents and, and not just paras, uh, you know, sort of getting the whole team involved um, is fantastic. And then uh, this, the low tech versus high tech piece, right? The PECs can be a very important step, um, you know, in terms of scaffolding up to the higher level. But, you know, as a, an actual high tech speech generating device is gonna be a lot more robust. It's gonna facilitate all this uh, morphology stuff, um, you know, which is foundational developmental literacy and just overall is more flexible and, uh, you know, also can be really engaging for the students. Um, I just wanna reiterate there, uh, I'm not sure that's my same takeaway about text. <laughs> <laughs> so I started thinking like, Okay, in the 1950s, we had interventions that we used, and we don't use those interventions anymore. And I just wonder if PEX is in that same camp. Like anything else, there's always a transition period, right? So I think that that's kind of what we're seeing right now. We're transitioning to a different medium and a different way of doing things, and there's always going to be early adopters, Chris, and late adopters. I mean, I guess we're all early adopters, but um, I think that, you know, for those people who are late to adopt, I guess it can be a stepping stone, but let's not get stuck there. And there's always considerations, right? There's always exceptions to the rule, but, um, but you know, I, as a general principle, I, I agree, Chris. Um, you know, I think that, if you know, especially as costs come down, there really isn't any reason to, to not make the jump, you know, sooner. On that note, we are curious to hear what you think, and we may very well hear a fair amount of it, but come track us down on Facebook, Talking With Tech. There's a group and a page. Come join the group. Um, we'd, we'd love to have the conversation there. 
Um, also, please do subscribe to the podcast on your medium of choice, whether that's Stitcher or the iTunes app, whatever that might be. Um, that helps people to find us, um, which we really appreciate. And then one last note is that we are actually going to alter our production schedule a little tiny bit. And I want to give a shout out real quick here to our awesome uh, producer, Luke Paget, who's been with us here for a while. Right, Luke? Oh, thank you. <laughs> so he's been giving us a, a, a ton of help and support and guidance for the last few months here. And, um, and then he's also going to be helping out um, or getting some assistance from, from, from a new helper named Michaela, which we also really appreciate. And for that reason, we're going we're gonna to take a little pause to, to rejigger our production. So we will be back uh, with you all in June. So not very far away. Um, and in the meantime, uh, we hope to hear from you. For Rachel and for Chris, this is Lucas Duber. And we'll talk to you all soon. <laughs>